The question on the table, of course, is whether or not China can rise peacefully. And as I'm sure almost all of you know, my argument is that China cannot rise peacefully. <laughs> I actually say that with great regret, but I do think it is the case. My argument, of course, is that you cannot think seriously about this issue without a theory. It is a theoretical issue. And the reason it's a theoretical issue is because we have no facts about the future. So when you talk about this question of whether China can rise peacefully, you have to have a theory, and that theory has to be one that you have confidence in. You have to believe that that theory uh, is good at explaining the past uh, and the present and the feedback. So my point is to understand or to think about the question of whether China can rise peacefully, you need a theory. And you have to have confidence in that theory. And you have to believe that that theory can explain the past and the present, and therefore will do a good job of explaining the future. Now, my theory, as most of you know, is a structural theory. So my argument is not that China can't rise peacefully because of its culture or because of its domestic politics. It's the structure of the international system that forces China to behave in a particular way. And that system forces the United States to behave in the same way as well. Now, what exactly is the theory? I basically believe that because states operate in an anarchic system, a system where there is no higher authority, where there's no night watchman, and where states cannot be certain about the intentions of other states, they have no choice but to maximize their relative power. The best way to survive in a system where there's no night watchman and where you can't be certain that another state at some point in time won't attack you is to be really powerful because really powerful states have a very good chance of surviving. Just think of the United States. How many Americans go to bed at night worrying about Canada or Mexico or Guatemala attacking us? The answer is hardly anybody thinks that. Why? Because we're so powerful. So what you want to do in international politics is you want to maximize your power. And what that means in practical terms, in my opinion, is you want to be, number one, a regional hegemon, and number two, you want to make sure that no other state in the system is a regional hegemon. In other words, that you have no peer competitor. If you are a regional hegemon, and of course the United States is a regional hegemon in the Western Hemisphere, if you're a regional hegemon, no other state in your region is capable of attacking you and threatening your survival. Now you're probably asking yourself, why is it that I argue that it is very important that you not have a peer competitor? Why is it important, for example, for the United States to make sure that Imperial Germany does not dominate Europe, or that the Soviet Union does, do does not dominate Europe, or that China does not dominate Asia? The answer is that if China were to dominate Asia, or Imperial Germany were to dominate Europe, it would be free to roam. And you're saying to yourself, what exactly does it mean to be free to roam? The United States, because it dominates the Western Hemisphere, and therefore faces those security threats in the Western Hemisphere, is free to roam into every nook and cranny of the world. You've noticed that the United States is omnipresent on the globe. We are everywhere. And the reason we are everywhere is because we are free to roam. From China's point of view, this is not a good situation. Because the Chinese are not happy with the fact 
that the United States has military forces stationed on its doorsteps. You don't like the fact that we run aircraft carriers into the Yellow Sea, into the Taiwan Straits, that we have airplanes right off your coast, that we have ground forces right off your coast. You would prefer for us to have to worry more about what's going on in the Western Hemisphere so we would have less time to pay attention to what's going on in Asia. Well, from an American point of view, we think the same way. From an American point of view, we do not want China to be free to roam. We do not want China to be free to roam into the Western Hemisphere. We don't want China to be free to roam into the Persian Gulf. We want China to focus on its own region. That means we want other great powers, other powerful states to be present in Asia so that China has to concentrate on them and is not free to wander into our backyard. And of course, from China's point of view, you're unhappy with a situation where we're free to roam because when we, the United States, are free to roam, we roam into your backyard, which is what we have been doing for quite a while now and we intend to do for a long time to come. <laughs> so to go back to square one, my argument is that in a world where there's no higher authority that you can turn to if you get into trouble, and where you can never be certain that another state won't come after you at some point. The best way to ensure your survival is to maximize your relative power. To be, as we used to say in New York when I was a boy, the biggest and baddest dude on the block. Because if you're the biggest and baddest dude on the block, nobody fools around with you. And of course, in more specific terms, this means you want to be number one, a regional hegemon, and number two, you want to make sure that you are the only regional hegemon on the planet, that no other country dominates its region the way you dominate yours. So that's my basic argument. Now, what I'd like to do is give you a brief sketch of American history and try to make the case that the United States has behaved according to the dictates of my theory. Because I believe this will give you some confidence that my theory is correct. And then when I'm done doing that, what I'm going to do is argue that China will behave the way the United States behaved and behaves. And that's consistent with my theory as well. If you look at American history over time, the history of American foreign policy over time, going back to 1783 when we got our independence from Britain. What you see is that the United States started out as 13 small colonies that ran up and down the Atlantic seaboard. Over the course of roughly the next 70 years, the United States marched across the continent from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean. We murdered huge numbers of Native Americans. We stole their land. We went to war against Mexico. And we stole what is today the southwest of the United States from Mexico. We invaded Canada in 1812 for the purposes of incorporating it into the United States. We had our gun sights on Canada for much of the 19th century. We would have expanded into the Caribbean had it not been for the slavery issue. The northern states did not want any more slave-holding states in the Union. And if we had incorporated areas in the Caribbean into the United States, they would have been slave-holding states. The United States had a voracious appetite for conquest. In modern history, there is no country that comes as close to the United States in terms of successful conquest. When Adolf Hitler invaded the Soviet Union on June 22, 1941, for the next few months, he talked frequently about how he was going to imitate what the United States did in North America in terms of carving out Lebensraum in the Soviet Union. Furthermore, not only did the United States go to great lengths to establish hegemony in the Western Hemisphere, over the course of the 20th century, we came up against four potential peer competitors. Imperial Germany, Imperial Japan, 
Nazi Germany, and the former Soviet Union. The United States played a key role in putting all four of those countries on the scrap heap of history. The United States would not tolerate the idea that any of those four countries would be a peer competitor. And the United States has made it clear on numerous occasions since the Cold War ended that we will not tolerate a peer competitor. We intend to remain the only regional hegemon in the international system. So the argument I'm making here is that if you look at American behavior since 1783, it's consistent with my basic theory. This brings us to the Chinese case. How is China likely to behave as it becomes much more powerful? And it's very important for you to understand, I'm not talking about China today, and I'm not talking about China tomorrow. I'm talking about China 10, 20, 30 years down the road, when it becomes very powerful, when it's much more powerful than it is today. And the question you want to ask yourself is, how is China likely to behave then? And my argument is, as China grows more powerful, it will go to great lengths to establish regional hegemony. Why? Because from China's point of view, it makes eminently good sense to be the most powerful state in Asia. All of the Chinese in the audience surely remember what happened in the past when China was weak. When China was weak, it was victimized. It was victimized by the other great powers. It would have been much better for China if from 1850 forward, it was by far the most powerful state on the planet, instead of being one of the weakest states on the planet. Because when you were weak, you were victimized. You want to be the biggest and baddest dude on the block. If I gave you a choice, you can be 50 times more powerful than Japan, or Japan can be 50 times more powerful to you than you. Do you think it makes any difference? Of course it makes difference. It makes a huge amount of difference. There's no Chinese person in his or her right mind who doesn't want to be 50 times more powerful than Japan. If you're Chinese, you want to be 50 times more powerful than Russia, <laughs> India, and Japan. You want to be the most powerful state in your region. Is that because you're evil? Is that because uh, you're obsessed with conquest? No. It's because the best way to survive in an anarchic system where you cannot know the intentions of other states, and some of those states may come at you at some point, is to be very, very powerful. Again, to go back to the United States of America, we are not so powerful on accident. The founding fathers and their successors went to great lengths to build a remarkably powerful state because that's the best way to maximize your security. And the Chinese will surely figure this out if they haven't already figured it out. You want to be really powerful. You want to be a regional hegemon. Now, the second thing that the Chinese are going to do is they're going to try and push the Americans out of Asia. They'd be fools not to. If I was a national security advisor in Beijing and the president asked me how we should think about the Americans, I'd say the farther we can get the Americans away from Asia, the better. I don't want them on our doorstep. I'm an American. We have this thing called the Monroe Doctrine. You've all heard of the Monroe Doctrine. In 1823, old President James Monroe told the European great powers, we are not now powerful enough to throw you out of this hemisphere but we're eventually going to reach the point where we are powerful enough to throw you out. And we're going to throw you out, and we want you to know you're not welcome back in the Western Hemisphere. The Monroe Doctrine is still operative today. If China gets really powerful and it tries to project power into the Western Hemisphere, we will not be happy at all. <laughs> should we expect China to have its own Monroe Doctrine? Of course we should. My mother taught me when I was a little boy, what's good for the goose is good for the gander. If it's good for us, why isn't it good for China? We don't like it when the Soviets come into the Western Hemisphere and try to put nuclear weapons and naval forces and ground forces in Cuba during the Cold War. We didn't like that at all. Why should you like it when the Americans are sitting on your doorstep and projecting power into your backyard? My point is, if you have a choice, and you think you can push us beyond the first island chain, you think you can push us beyond the second island chain, you will do it. And you do will do it because you're a good strategist. You understand. The goal here is to establish regional hegemony. And that means, number one, being the most powerful state in your region. And number two, it means 
that you don't want the United States or any other distant great power in your backyard. So this is what I think is going to happen. And this brings us to the question, what is the United States going to do as China tries to establish regional hegemony? The theory is quite clear, and the empirical record is quite clear. The United States of America does not tolerate peer competitors. We will go to enormous lengths to contain Chinese power. We will go to enormous lengths to make sure that China does not dominate Asia. The same way we went to great lengths to make sure Imperial Germany, Imperial Japan, Nazi Germany, and the former Soviet Union didn't dominate either Europe or Asia. You can already see evidence of it. What do you think the pivot to Asia is all about? You don't believe the Americans when they say it has nothing to do with containing China? This is typical American hypocrisy. Nobody in their right mind believes that. <laughs> the pivot to Asia is all about containing China. And the more power China accrues, the more the United States will pivot to Asia. Because we intend to contain you. The theory is clear and the history is clear. And you, of course, will not be happy about that because you'll be interested in getting us out of Asia for good strategic reasons. The end result of all this is we're going to have, if China continues to rise, an intense security competition. Is war inevitable? No. Is war possible? Yes. We could posit all sorts of scenarios where the Americans and the Chinese end up shooting at each other. Could be over Taiwan, could be over Korea, could be over the South China Sea, could be over the Diao Islands. Who knows? But there are potential flashpoints there. And when you marry those potential flashpoints with the fact that you're going to have an intense security competition, the potential for trouble is very great. Let me end by making one quasi-optimistic argument. <laughs> Uh, my case is based on a theory, as I said early on. And as almost all of you know, there's no social science theory that gets it right all the time. Social science theories are actually crude instruments. We have no choice but to employ theories to make sense of the world. The world is enormously complicated. We need theories to make sense of it. And as I said early on, if you're going to try and predict what happens as China rises, there's no way you could do that without a theory. But theories, because they're simplifications of reality, leave out all sorts of factors that sometimes matter greatly. For a realist like me who focuses on power and structure, domestic politics doesn't matter in my story. But in reality, domestic politics occasionally matters. And that's one of the reasons that my theory is sometimes proved wrong. No theory, again, is perfect. My best guess, and this is purely intuitive, is that the best theories get it right 75% of the time. That means they're wrong 25% of the time. Let's assume, just for argument's sake, that my theory is one of the best theories out there. It gets me a slot in the Hall of Fame. Just assume that. Even if that's true, I'm still wrong 25% of the time. Given the bleak picture that I've just described, let's hope that with regard to the rise of China, that will turn out to be one of the instances in which my theory is proved wrong. Thank you.